Hey folks, Mike Spurlock here. I am going to give you a little information about how to make sauce in this segment. Uh, some people thought it'd be a good idea for me to post some information about how to make pizza at home without all the fancy ingredients and equipment, and so I'm going to do that. I'm going to start by going to my Louis Louis Detroit style pizza book, The How-To Guide, that I published on Amazon earlier last year and flip over to the page that talks about sauce and I've got a picture here of the tomatoes that I typically like to use but here is the ingredient list so I've got one can of 20 ounce or 28 ounce can of tomatoes half a tablespoon of dried basil leaf half a tablespoon of dried oregano half a teaspoon of garlic powder and a teaspoon of salt so we're going to start there the next part about making the pizza sauce, or this is just a good general marinara sauce that I use in many of my recipes, is I start out with some great tomatoes. I generally like the San Marzano tomatoes from southern Italy. Um, they have a great flavor that goes with the cheese that I typically use in my pizza, but uh, these Mirglen organic whole peel tomatoes work just fine, as do the crushed tomatoes. Um, to me, the differences are subtle. And, uh, you know, you can get some of these Mirror Glen that are actually um, more, uh, they're cooked and, and uh, fire roasted, so they have more of a smokiness. Uh, that may or may not be something that you want in your pizza. But any of these are fine because, to me, what really makes the flavor of the sauce, aside from the type of tomatoes that you use, is the uh, spices and other ingredients that you put in here. So there's my salt. There's my leaf oregano, my leaf basil, and granulated garlic. So I have pre-measured all of these. According to what was in the book, I have doubled the recipe because over here in my saucepan, I've actually used two 28-ounce uh, cans of San Marzano tomatoes that have already been crushed. So I'm going to go ahead and add all of these. And once this gets added in and stirred uh, throughout, the smells and the flavors will really start to permeate the kitchen, which is the part that I love. And the last really important thing is when I, I'm using a stainless steel saucepan here, but notice I'm using a wooden spoon that I've recently cleaned. Uh, you want to use something that is non-reactive to deal with tomatoes because tomatoes are um, acidic and when you put something that is uh, metal uh, that comes in contact with uh, with the acid from the tomatoes it can bring that uh, that metallic taste out in the tomatoes which you don't want so I would either use a wooden spoon or a wooden spatula or something that is plastic so I'm gonna go ahead and turn the temperature on about three which is kind of like a low medium and start to get this up to temp but generally what I will do with my sauce to make it taste extra good and to thicken it up because this is a little watery right now I don't add any pre-prepared uh, sauce or tomato paste to it it's all ground tomatoes is I will cook this pretty much all afternoon uh, three, four, five hours, and it'll really cook down. You want to keep stirring it from time to time, but it'll lose a lot of the water. It'll thicken up, and it will make just the perfect uh, pizza sauce. So that's the sauce. In this next segment, I'm going to show you how to make the dough. So in my book, I have all kinds of information about the difference between Detroit style and traditional uh, crusts and what we're doing here is kind of a hybrid between the two so we're going to start with some pretty decent unbleached all-purpose flour uh, that's just what I happen to have laying around but I also really like this King Arthur um, it's kind of a all-purpose artisan flour it um, it works really well has a good flavor to the crust but pretty much anything will do for the purposes that we're doing today so I've got my measuring cup this um, goes up to about four cups one quart which would be liquid and that is about the leveling line that we are going to use here for uh, 18 ounces as you can see on my 
scale, a little bit over 18 ounces uh, by weight. And typically, I measure everything by weight, not by volume. But since you may not have a kitchen scale, I'm just giving you, you know, about 18 ounces of flour is going to be about four cups in one of these nice Pyrex um, measuring cups. So I'm going to go ahead and pour this into a nice big uh, mixing bowl. And I'm going to take this, uh, this cup right here and I'm just going to put it in here and create a well in the center. So one of the differences between what I teach in my book and what, you, what we would do in the restaurant and what I typically do when I make dough at home is I have a um, semi-professional mixer that I use that's about 700 watts and it will crank and it's got a dough hook and it works great. So if you've got one of those, you don't have to go through this. But this exercise is for people that do not have a... Um, a professional mixer, a KitchenAid mixer, or what have you, and a dough hook. Next thing I'm going to do is I want to measure out my water. So um, there's this weird thing called Baker's Math, and here's you know the way that you scale using Baker's Math because this is what uh, the terms that I'm going to use here. So everything is as a percentage. Everything that you add to the recipe for bread or for dough is going to be a percentage of the weight of the flour. So in this case, we are going to use uh, about 60% water by weight. So I'm going to reuse my Pyrex uh, measuring device here. And I'm going to go ahead and fill this up with some warm water. And I'm not going to fill it all the way, but I'm going to try to get to 60% of 18 ounces is about 10.8 ounces and so I got a little bit more to go here and what I've done on the temperature of the water and that looks just about right maybe just a little splash okay now it's a little bit over pour a little bit of that out All right, and that's right where I want to be. So, um, so again, if you don't have a scale, what you could do if you're trying to match what I'm doing, and you've got one of these uh, these Pyrex uh, measuring devices here. So we're looking at about a little bit less than 12 fluid ounces there, if you can see that. Okay. So the water, you hear the water running over here. And if I can put my hand under it like that and not burn it, um, then it's, you know, and it's not too cold, then it's probably about the right temperature for the yeast, which we're going to add here in a second. Now, I do have a digital thermometer, and I checked it just a second ago, and it was at 98, which if it's somewhere between the low 90s and about 110 degrees, it's going to be fine. Now, it looks like it has... Uh, cooled off just a little bit but there we go yeah so the water that I have in there is going to be perfect but again if you don't have a digital thermometer just uh, stick your stick your finger under it and if you can um, if you can keep your hand on it without burning it or if not being too cold it will be fine so 97.2 degrees that is going to be perfect and so the next thing I'm going to do is I've got this dry active yeast from Red Star. It's the brand that I typically like to use. As you can see, I opened this uh, quite a while ago, over a year ago, and uh, I keep it in the refrigerator. I use a fair amount of it. Uh, this was about, this, what's in this container was about half of what the original package was of two pounds. But anyway, I'm going to just take about a third of this teaspoon here. And I'm going to go ahead and add it in, stir it around. Now, all I'm doing there is I'm proofing that yeast to make sure that the yeast is good, okay? Uh, if I keep something in the refrigerator for a long time or if I've got an open packet of something, I just want to make sure that it's still going to work. But I'm going to go ahead and do the right thing here and put this back in the refrigerator. When, uh, when I do that, nothing's going to happen because... Uh, 
it needs something to eat. The yeast does. So what I like to do for this kind of pizza is I, you know, I could put sugar in there, I could put diastatic malt, but I like to put a little bit of honey in. Uh, honey is very, very efficient as a sweetener. You don't need a lot of it. Uh, I like this organic raw uh, honey, and that's going to work just fine. As you can see, I got a lot going on here. I got some pasta, and I got my sauce simmering over there. But I'm going to go ahead and give this a second, and uh, just make sure that this yeast is good, and I'll show you what it looks like when I know that it's good. I had a little mishap with my camera and uh, I did not record the last segment but basically I was looking for the yeast to bloom which it did and it started to turn cloudy and started to uh, float up and kind of explode on the top and turn this murky color so I went ahead and added it uh, directly into my uh, flour well and there's really nothing else that you have to do from there as far as waiting for the yeast to proof up. Uh, once you know the, the yeast is good it will take care of itself once it's mixed in with the flour. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little olive oil on my hands and I'm going to dig in here and start kneading this dough and mixing it all up inside the bowl. Um, I can't hold the camera and do that at the same time so I will show you different stages as it goes as I wash my hands off. And here's what the dough looks like after about three or four minutes of kneading with my hands. I'm taking it and I'm doing this and I'm folding the outsides to the insides and I'm just doing that constantly until I feel like I've got all the hard spots that don't have any moisture mixed in and uh, it's starting to look like and feel like dough. Now here is a, an important tip. Um, actually it's yeah it's kind of important. So I did not put any salt in there and I'm going to go ahead and do that right now. And for this amount, I am just going to sprinkle a little dusting of this sea salt over the top. You can see it right there. Now, the reason that I do that is because uh, salt will interfere with the absorption of the yeast and the water into the flour. So uh, it's, you know, you can add it all together. Uh, we used to do it at the restaurant. But you really get a, you know, and it's more efficient that way, but you get a little better outcome this way with the yeast uh, getting absorbed into the glutens and the, in the uh, flour. So as you can see, I've got, I'm starting to get a really nice dough ball here. And once I do this for a few more minutes, I mean, again, that didn't take any kind of a professional mixer. It just took a little bit of elbow grease. Um, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a nice ball. I'm going to set it right back in the bowl, I'm going to pour a little bit of extra virgin olive oil over the top of it. And what that does is helps to prevent it from uh, hitting the air and creating a skin, which we really do not want. It's not the end of the world, but we really do not want. And uh, then I'm going to cover this with a towel for about an hour. And, you know, you can let it proof in a Ziploc bag overnight. That's the way I usually do it. But if you're uh, family is waiting for you to get some pizza going. I have seen uh, professional pizza makers in Naples, Italy, Venice, Sorrento, Rome make it just like I did it here except they didn't have a bowl. They just did it right on the countertop and they rolled it out into a, into a ball um, and they just took one of these little uh, uh, rolling pins and rolled me out a nice like 10 ounce or 8 or 10 ounce uh, round and put it right in the oven and it was some of the best pizza. And this is what the dough ball looks like when I have given it its olive oil bath. So as you notice I just put a thin coat on there. There's a little bit settling on the bottom. That's not going to hurt anything and now I'm going to go ahead and set a towel over top of it so that it can expand and rest and you'll be amazed when I look at this in about an hour, hour and a half from now, uh, how much it has expanded. At this point, we are ready to start rolling out the dough and assembling a pizza. So right over here in my oven, I have turned my temperature up to 500 degrees, so it's in the process of preheating. I have a couple of things out here that I'm going to need for this process. I kept my flour out and went ahead and floured the cutting board that I was resting the bowl on earlier. 
Uh, I'm going to need that when I'm rolling out the dough. I've got two different types of cheese that I bought at Kroger that are sitting out here that will work just fine for this. Just because I use this fancy Wisconsin brick cheese uh, uh, for my Detroit style pizzas, um, unless you travel up to the Detroit or Toledo area, it's going to be hard to find around here. So, but these will work just fine. One thing that you need to note. Um, is that when you use the low moisture part skim and uh, this uh, Monterey Jack is a little bit wetter but the low moisture tends to cook pretty fast and can burn so you have to be careful with it so that is as opposed to over here and grab this out of my refrigerator the low moisture part skim uh, mozzarella so this when it comes when it's not already pre-shredded even though it says it's low moisture has a lot more moisture in it than the shredded cheese so if you want to cut this up or actually buy buffalo mozzarella or other fresh mozzarella that uh, type of cheese will do a lot better in a hot oven it, it will take longer to melt but it's going to be a lot harder to burn. So uh, it's really a matter of the flavor profile that you're looking for, but you can just go over in the dairy section and get these two cheeses, and you could very easily mix these 50-50. You could do uh, you know, 70% Monterey Jack and 30% mozzarella. It's whatever you like, but those are the cheeses that I typically like to use if I'm not using the Wisconsin brick. So over here, I've got my... Uh, mixing bowl that's got the dough in it and as you can see from the previous video this has about doubled in size it's only been proofing for about an hour it definitely could have gone longer but um, you know it's, it's up to you how much you want it to proof the main thing that it's going to be doing is that yeast is going to continue to digest uh, the proteins and it's going to continue to exhale uh, CO2 where it will expand and it will add uh, volume and air to the crust and make it lighter and airier. Now for the kind of pizza that we're making today which is going to be generally a thin crust with some rise to it um, you know you're not, you're not going to be that interested in um, in having a lot of air in it so it will it will get some uh, just by virtue of heating up but at this point I'm going to show you then how to roll out the dough so right now I'm going to reach in here I've just washed my hands thoroughly I'm going to reach in here and I'm going to tear off um, about an eight ounce chunk. Now, again, if you don't have a scale, I'll show you the size of the dough ball and what it ends up being when we roll it out. And uh, I'll do that next. So as you can see, I've torn off about a quarter of the 32 ounce dough ball that I had there, uh, which is going to make me one eight ounce dough ball. Obviously, 32 divided by four is eight, so that should give me about four in total. So here's the dough ball, and what I did is I took it in both hands and um, I just continued to fold it under, as I'm doing right here, and the objective here is to just make sure that it is thoroughly mixed, that there's no uh, uneven spots, no hard spots, and that what I end up with is a nice round ball. And the reason for the round ball is if you start with a round ball, then you should end up with a round pizza. If you end up with one that is oblong or kind of oddly shaped, then that's not what you're going to get. You're, well, you're going to get one that's oddly shaped. So if you want one that's round, start with a round ball. So there it is, and I've gone ahead and put it right on my, um, my floured cutting board. And I'm going to start pressing this out. And, you know, if I wasn't holding the camera, I would be doing this with both hands. And in a second here, I'm going to go ahead and take my rolling pin, and I'm going to flatten this out into a round... Uh, uh, pizza crust and you know you probably don't need a lot of imagination to know how that's going to go the main thing that I will tell you is to just roll it evenly in both directions so if I do it a couple times going this way then I want to do it a couple times going the opposite way so that it is stretching in a in an even fashion so that I will end up with something that will 
um, look like a pizza pie. So there it is, and I'm going to go ahead and work on this for another minute or two until I get it whipped into shape, and then I'll show you what it looks like. So here's what the crust looks like after I spent a couple of minutes trying to shape it and form it. Uh, just using my fingers, going around the edges, pinching the edges so that I've got kind of a little, little edge there, a little curb to kind of hold some of the juices and ingredients and stuff that's going to burn off in the baking process. Kind of like when you do a pie crust. If you've ever seen those pie crusts that have like fingerprints in them, that's how they started. That's the way my grandmother used to make them. So it's kind of the same process. So it's not perfectly round, but it is uh, round enough for me. And actually, you know, some of those little straight lines like that add a little bit of character to me. So the next thing I'm going to do is since, you know, most of you may not have a pizza stone, uh, or I'm assuming that you don't. If you do, pizza stones are awesome, but I still like to use this method when I'm cooking inside and not using a commercial oven. So I've got a piece of foil here. Non-stick foil works the best, but I was out of it. So in order to make this a little bit more non-stick, I'm going to take my olive oil and I'm just going to put a little bit on here. And I'm going to rub it around on there really good so that um, it doesn't stick any more than necessary. So that'll make it a lot easier to get the to get the pizza off of the foil when we're done. Okay, now that I have smoothed out the olive oil on the foil, I'm going to go ahead and set the crust on there. Now, before I do that, one thing that I like to do is if I have some cornmeal, some coarse cornmeal or some semolina flour. I like to put that down on the foil uh, or on the pizza stone um, or whatever I'm going to be, whatever surface I'm going to be baking it on because it helps add a little bit more structure to the crust. It also helps get the crust off of the, uh, the foil or the, the um, uh, pizza stone or baking surface. So I'm going to go ahead and I don't have any coarse uh, cornmeal uh, since I used it all to make cornbread back uh, a couple of months ago over the holidays. So at this point, uh, I'm just going to use some semolina flour, which is the yellowish flour, very fine, that is used to make pasta. And there I have added my semolina. This is what the semolina looks like. I like the Bob's Red Mill number one Durham wheat. Works great. And because I did a great job of flouring the surface that I put the dough on, and you can just use a uh, granite countertop if you've got one, or like I have a, uh, um, a cutting surface. Uh, it lifted right up, had no tears, no problems, and I was just able to put it right down on the flour, or on the uh, semolina treated uh, foil, and uh, straighten it out just a little bit. Now I'm gonna go ahead and add some sauce and my other ingredients. So my sauce has been cooking down and you can see it's, uh, it's got a little thicker consistency now. And so uh, unlike Detroit and Chicago style pizza, I'm gonna go ahead and put this directly on the dough. It will create a little gum line, which again, for these purposes and this kind of pizza is fine. Uh, the gum line is that little section of the dough that really doesn't cook out because of the moisture that, um, uh, that's in the sauce from when you put it directly on. Um, you know, some sauces are a lot drier. Uh, over in Italy, they tend not to use a ton of sauce. I like a lot of sauce. And so, um, you know, your individual results with the gum line will, will vary. If you buy traditional New York style pizza, they tend to have uh, a big old gum line because they like lots of sauce on that, uh, on that dough. So there it is. And I'm gonna set this back over here and put it on warm. There's my pasta, it came out very nice. Um, okay, so now I've got a great base to add my cheese and my toppings and I'm gonna do that next. So next up is the cheese and I am just going to go ahead and sprinkle first this, uh, this low moisture part skim mozzarella right on here. It's clumping in a couple of spots which I'll smooth out here in a minute, but just want to get a nice little coating on there. Next, do the same thing with my Monterey Jack. 
which again shreds and melts a lot like the mozzarella and uh, Wisconsin brick cheese that I like to use but it has more zing, it has more flavor. The, the mozzarella is really just kind of a binder, uh, typically does not have a lot of flavor, but these other cheeses like the Monterey Jack has tons and tons of flavor, so I always like to add that in when I'm making a pizza. Uh, whether it's my Detroit style or otherwise, I used to mix Monterey Jack with Wisconsin brick cheese for the cheese uh, mixture that we used at the restaurant, and it just gave the most amazing flavors. So there is a homemade cheese pizza that you can do uh, for very little money. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, add some pepperoni to this to make it a little bit more interesting. And I have some uncured uh, turkey pepperoni actually that I'm going to use. And then I'm going to put it in the oven in my 500 degree oven and we will show you how that comes out. So there's the pizza that we just made after adding the uh, uncured turkey pepperoni. And uh, there's the pepperoni dog. <laughs> this is her favorite part of the day because she loves pepperoni. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and put this in the oven. Um, if you have a pizza peel or something that you can use to transfer this to the rack, um, that would be advisable, but just be careful not to let it slide off onto the floor. But that's all I'm going to be using right there is I've got a hot box with... Um, you know, the rack's exposed, and I'm going to put the foil right on the rack. And so there it is in the oven, and uh, it's perfectly positioned, so I'm going to go ahead and close that up, and I'm going to set my timer for about eight minutes. And start. And it's probably going to take longer to, to uh, bake than eight minutes, but that's about the time that I want to take a look at it. So we'll look at it here in a second. And here we are at the eight minute mark, so I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at it. I just put some bread in there that I used the leftover dough to make, but I uh, guess I shouldn't have done that so I can see it better. But anyway, it's looking pretty darn good. I'm gonna go ahead and spin this around, try not to burn myself, but it's looking an awful lot like a pizza crust. And it's sliding right off that foil, so I gotta be careful there. Don't wanna burn myself. Yeah, it's looking good. A couple more minutes and that dude's gonna be ready. And here is the finished product. So, I do say so, that's not a bad looking homemade pizza. It is nicely done up underneath. I'll just go ahead and, uh, I don't know if you have a traditional pizza cutter, but you can use one of these to cut it up or you can just use a chef's knife. I'm gonna go ahead and use this since I have it. You know, the camera angles are not perfect because I'm doing all this by myself, but uh, hopefully you get the gist. So there's the pizza when I have cut it up into several pieces, and I'm going to go ahead and take a couple of these slices and my spatula, and there we go. They're ready to eat. So hopefully that'll give you something to do while you're at home with the kids and uh, maybe afraid to call your local restaurant, although... I will say for the restaurant industry, the restaurants are having a very, very tough time right now and they need your business more than ever. So if there is a place that you like that is doing curbside service or carry out uh, or delivery, please do not hesitate to call them because you, you're going to see a lot of them going out of business because I don't think they're going to make it through this if, uh, if we don't frequent them. So anyway, I wouldn't recommend doing this every night of the week, but... If uh, you want to learn how to make your own pizza at home without all the fancy ingredients and equipment, this is certainly a little primer on how to do it. If you want to up your pizza making game, then you can acquire my book, Louie Louie's Detroit Style Pizza Book, a how-to guide. It's all about how to make Detroit style pizza. And it's what, what I just gave you today is uh, very similar to the lecture that, uh, or the, uh, the workshop that Mike Frick and I, I uh, have a picture of the two of us uh, doing the home and garden show for the Trend Appliances and Joe Dumpstorf. We used to do that every year and we would give a little, um, little workshop on how to make these pizzas and then we would let people eat them. So with that, I'm going to try to eat my own dog food here and I hope that yours comes out as well as mine. Thank you. And of course, if you want to take your pizza up a couple notches after you take your plain pepperoni out of the oven, you could add some fresh basil, a little bit of sea salt, and a few 
little chunks of feta cheese. That will really turn something ordinary into something rather extraordinary.